You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 51, The Second Sino-Japanese War, Part 2, Moving South. This week, a big thank you goes out to Tim for their support of the podcast on Patreon, where they now get access to special ad-free versions of all of these podcast episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes released roughly every month. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more information. Last episode, we discussed why Japan was interested in establishing an area of control in China and why that area would be Manchuria. We, of course, know that the establishment of the puppet state of Manchuria, or Manchukuo, would not be the end of the adventures of ja- the Japanese in China, and instead, they would endeavor over the course of the next decade to extend their influence. And during that expansion, they would eventually fall into a full-scale war with China. This episode, we will first look at why the Japanese felt they had to constantly increase the territory under their control before looking at the Marco Polo Bridge incident, which would ignite the Second Sino-Japanese War. That will then set us up to discuss the Battle of Shanghai, which will occupy the next several episodes. After Manchuria had been conquered, it was completely possible for the Japanese to simply stop and and be satisfied with what they controlled, but they were not. Before we jump into the events of that expansion, let's first just talk about why the Japanese thought they needed to expand and what they thought Chinese resistance would be like. The key to early expansion in northern China was around security. The Japanese military hoped to create a kind of buffer zone between the nationalist-controlled areas and the new state of Manchukuo. This would prevent any Japanese incursions into Manchukuo, which grew ever more important as the contributions of Manchukuo to the Japanese economy continued to increase. Along with this, they also felt that they had to gain greater control of those areas because as they expanded into northern China, there were growing problems in the new Japanese-controlled territories due to local bandits and other groups of, of Chinese resistance. They would attack and damage Japanese infrastructure throughout northern China, using the aid provided to them from Chinese leaders within Chinese-controlled territory. This would then prompt the Japanese to move further south to cut off those supplies and that support, where they would then repeat the same process. The hope was always that the next objective to be captured would cause Chang and the nationalists to come to the negotiating table, where the Japanese control of northern China would be formalized. In the wide expanses of northern China, most of these objectives revolved around territory. The constant need to capture the territory up to the next river or the next province or other nexts would be the reason for the constant expansion of Japanese territory up up to like 1944. Often this territorial expansion was combined with the goal of eliminating as many Chinese soldiers as possible, but beyond that there there would be little in terms of additional operational level goals or planning beyond the next objective. Follow-on operations would be left to later planning after the first were accomplished. However, no matter how much territory they captured, the Chinese just kept retreating, and no matter what was done, the nationalists would not participate in the negotiations, at least in the way that the Japanese wanted, as a defeated enemy. This general lack of understanding would be another consistency throughout most of the Second Sino-Japanese War. The Japanese military would have a very good, often near-perfect understanding of the Chinese military's situation in terms of units and positioning and movements. This was due to the fact that they broke the primary codes used by the Chinese military, and they would read over two-thirds of all communications sent by the Chinese military in northern China. Even with this very clear understanding of numbers and dispositions, 
they consistently misinterpreted the political situation. This would come into play into a much larger way after 1937, but even during the 1930s, there was just a general misunderstanding about the resiliency of the nationalist government when faced with the Japanese threat. It was, in general, much stronger than the Japanese assumed, which would be proven time and time again over the next eight years. This complete underestimation of their enemy would result in the belief among Japanese military leaders in the mid-1930s that the territory in northern China could be maintained with a relatively small commitment of military resources. This low level of commitment was essential because the entire purpose of controlling areas of China was to provide more resources for usage against other enemies, primarily the United States if you were speaking to the Japanese Navy, or the Soviet Union if you were asking the army. In fact, the plans to expand production of raw and finished materials in China, and then also to expand the Japanese military as a whole, was based on a five-year plan to expand production. But to accomplish those goals, and those goals that were set down in the plan, they needed five years of peace. War was both expensive and a constant drain on resources and personnel, and war is exactly what the Japanese would continue to perpetuate. After 1936, this became problematic, as it was clear that the Soviet military was growing in strength. The Japanese army saw the Soviet Union as its greatest possible foe, and a war with the Soviet Union was the event for which the army planned its expansion, and part of why they wanted territory in northern China, a place to fight the Soviet Union. Oddly enough, these fears would cause the army to devote more and more resources to fighting China, in the belief that an intact and powerful China was almost destined to take advantage of the situation in the event of a second Russo-Japanese war, and so first China had to be dealt with. There would be many small skirmishes with the Soviets, which will be covered in later episodes, but after the start of the Second World War, they would sign the Soviet-Japanese Neutrality Pact in early 1941. However, before that date, the looming threat of a war with the Soviet Union would be an important driver of Japanese actions in all of their Chinese adventures. In the early years of Japanese expansion, they generally did not just send troops into another province without at least pretending there was a reason. For example, in one northern province, they would claim that it was actually part of Manchukuo, and so they were just moving troops into Manchukuo's legitimate territory. They were very successful in this movement, partially because the local Chinese leader, who had been provided with foods and funds to equip his troops, had instead spent the money on himself instead of on the military. In other areas, the Japanese would bribe local commanders to allow them to take control. For example, in the Hopei province, where local bribes to commanders allowed for a somewhat peaceful transition of power. Eventually, they would use these bribes on a wider scale, that would allow for the negotiation of a demilitarized zone in northern Hopei. Theoretically, this arrangement sort of moved the area towards peace, with neither side having an advantage. But in this case, it just put all the territory under Japanese control, because the Chinese military had to leave. Not every expansion was peaceful, and there would be serious fighting in some instances. But it was not the nationalist army, the Chinese national army, that the Japanese were fighting but instead local military leaders who often had far fewer resources and were far less prepared. By May 30th, 1933, the advance had reached the Great Wall, and the Tengu Truce would be signed the next day with the nationalist leaders. This required the Japanese to retreat north of the Great Wall, and to also give back some of the territory in eastern Hopei. Even if this represented a moment of reprieve from further Japanese advances, It still meant that the long series of Chinese withdrawals were in some ways formalized, and it would not take long before they would continue. After the Tengu Truce was signed, instead of expanding their territory south, the Japanese would spend the next few years expanding their power within the regions that they already controlled. They attempted to fully separate the northern provinces, everything north of the Great Wall, from the control of the nationalist government in the south. All of these actions did nothing to help Chang and his credibility with other Chinese leaders. Chang believed that the Japanese goals were to turn the entirety of China into a Manchukuo-like puppet state, and so there would have to come a point where these arrangements were either submitted to or the Chinese leaders chose to resist. Until that time, Chang sought to buy time. He would continue to ensure that there would not be a coalition of other leaders or factions that could threaten his leadership, but the threat of this continued to grow, and this delaying action about the Japanese advances could only continue for a finite period because as the Japanese continued to control more and more territory, they also reduced nationalist economic power, 
For example, the customs income of the nationalist government, which made up a pretty sizable portion of the total government income, was greatly reduced because of Japanese control of more and more territory in the north. During this period, there were further attempts by the nationalists to begin some level of negotiations with the Japanese, if only to buy more time. Chang personally expressed a willingness to come to the negotiating table with the Japanese, but this was often blocked by the Japanese army. It's unlikely that such negotiations would have borne fruit, though, based on the mindset that both sides had about what the negotiations should be based on. Chang wanted to sign a treaty that left the Chinese in control of northern China, but made other concessions to achieve that goal. The Japanese approached any negotiation under the idea that they would not accept anything less than the acceptance by Chang and the Chinese of Japanese control of northern China. Both sides thought that negotiations of, of some kind was an acceptable in-game, but both sides approached these negotiations with incompatible goals. Starting in the spring of 1936 and running for several months, a committee was set up back in Tokyo to determine what Japan should be doing in China. The general policy involved four objectives that Japanese policy would push towards. The independence of northern China from the government in Nanking, the economic development of both Manchuria and northern China, continued attempts to engage the Nanking government in negotiations based on very favorable terms, and the support for Mongolian independence. Just a small note on that last one, which seems a bit out of place. The goal around Mongolian independence was aimed at weakening the power of the Soviet Union in the region. Most of the Soviet and Japanese fighting would occur in Mongolia, both inner and outer, and so promotion of Mongolian independence was really just an attempt to create a buffer zone between Japanese and Soviet-controlled territory. For the other three objectives, which did center around northern China, the hope was to avoid further military conflict. This ties back into the push from the military leaders in Tokyo for an intensification of preparations for the planned war with the Soviet Union, which required far fewer resources to be spent on fighting the Chinese. The avoidance of such entanglements would be the official policy of the Japanese Army General Staff during the rest of 1936 and into 1937. They would even go so far as to declare in early 1937 that the Japanese Army was no longer pursuing a policy that would fully separate northern China from Nanking control, and instead they would accept a continued nationalist presence and control under certain circumstances. This overall shift in Japanese policy towards a position that seemed more acceptable to the Chinese was simply happening too late. By the time that the Japanese were looking to pursue a political end to the fighting, they had already inflamed Chinese opinion to the point where the concessions that the Japanese would offer were simply not enough. To quote historian Mark Petey, quote, While Japan, for reasons that may have been entirely self-interested and delusional, was prepared now to moderate its near half-century of aggression in China, its change of attitude was a half century too late. End quote. The Japanese were trying to do the equivalent of breaking into someone's home, taking control of the kitchen and the bathroom, and then wanting to negotiate about giving back the bathroom. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, 
every other week for a new episode where I'd like to tell you a story. Whatever hopes that the Japanese leaders may have had in a peaceful result for their Chinese adventure would be dashed on January 7, 1937. During the night, a Japanese company would be doing night exercises southwest of Beijing near the Marco Polo Bridge. One of their number would be separated from the unit and become lost in the night. The Japanese unit, believing that foul play was involved, insisted that the local Chinese units allow the Japanese to search their positions that they were occupying, which they of course refused to allow. Shots were then fired and the situation quickly escalated. Japanese reinforcements were brought in and an assault was launched on the Chinese units and then it was demanded that they withdraw. They would actually comply with this ultimatum, but apparently not fast enough for the local Japanese officers, and so on July 9th, they were hit with artillery. Oh, and by the way, that missing soldier returned completely unharmed, and it turned out he really had just gotten lost, and was not in some way captured or kidnapped by the Chinese. When news arrived back in Japan, the policy decided on, both by the political and military leadership, was one of non-escalation. They didn't want this small clash to ripple out into larger fighting. Instead, they would allow the local Japanese representatives to work on negotiating a settlement, which would calm things down. This strategy had worked before, but this time it wouldn't, and it was because the Chinese did not go along. Nationalist troops were moved into the region, and so instead of allowing local units to come to terms, the Chinese escalated their commitment, making it clear that they were not going to allow events to just once again blow over. These troop movements were known to the Japanese, who had very good intelligence on all Chinese troop movements, and the decision was made in the evening of July 10th to request that three divisions be mobilized in Japan for possible dispatch to China. When this request was passed on to the cabinet, there were not huge concerns with mobilizing the troops, but the cabinet would issue an official policy statement which made it clear to Nanking that it should not interfere with the ongoing local settlement attempts. The firm nature of this demand was intended to frighten the Chinese and push them closer to allowing such a settlement out of concern for a Japanese military response. But the leaders in Nanking, whose greatest fear was once again another local settlement which saw more territory given over completely to Japanese control, were unwilling to allow such an action to happen again after it had happened so many times in northern China. Instead, they would state that they were determined to allow a negotiation to happen. That was fine, but it had to be one that did not alter the control that the nationalist government had over the area. The position of both sides to use military force to force the other into a specific negotiating position would end in war. With the Chinese not backing down, the Japanese general staff requested once again on July 26th for the three divisions to be mobilized. The initial plan was for these troops to be sent to China for three months, with a total mobilization and expedition cost of about 100 million yen. They would then secure the shipping on the 28th, both to initially transport the troops and then to carry their necessary supplies during their time in China. The 450,000 tons of shipping that was required would cause economic problems, as as it was taken mostly from shipping that had been bringing raw materials back from Manchuria in northern China to the home islands, but it was felt that it was necessary and would be just a short-term problem for a long-term gain. The idea of the troops only being needed for three months uh, seems hopelessly optimistic uh, when you look back on it now, but it was actually on the pessimistic side of Japanese estimates, with others like the Japanese war minister estimating that they would be done in, in as little as a month. There were many people who did not want to get involved in a long-term struggle in China, but these concerns were drowned out by the overriding belief that there would be no long-term serious Chinese resistance. Before we go any further, let's talk about the Japanese military at this point in time. I think there's a tendency to take the portrayal of the Japanese army as seen in kind of the late stages of the Pacific War, where in comparison to the heavily modernized American military, it looked backwards and quaint. And to sort of apply that image and that comparison to earlier fighting. In fact, during the fighting in China, and especially during the early fighting that we are about to discuss, the Japanese would bring the superior firepower and the more modern equipment to the fighting. 
There was the same heavy belief in the offensive, the emphasis on night attacks, and just a general idea that shock actions against the enemy were the best way to proceed with an offensive. However, when that was joined with the technological superiority that they had when fighting against the Chinese, it could be a devastating combination. Most of their larger weapons, like artillery and tanks, were, were light, but it also made them mobile, which was important because the army was not heavily mechanized, with the number of automobiles produced in Japan paltry in comparison to other nations in the 1930s. This meant that they heavily relied on animal and human power for transport. Speaking of transport, I like this bit of information uh, about the Japanese sort of logistical setup uh, from historian Edward Dre. Quote, according to logistic doctrine, Japanese maneuver units normally operated within 120 to 180 mile radius of a railhead for purposes of resupply and reinforcement. The field train support unit moved supplies daily from the railhead to a divisional control point for distribution. The division established a field depot to move supplies from field transport to company and lower echelon units. At the depot, transport troops transferred supplies to a combat train that hauled the ammunition, rations, and equipment to the frontline units. Now, while they were truly a step above the Chinese troops in some ways, this advantage was lessened by assumptions made about the fighting quality of Chinese troops and Chinese soldiers. This caused a constant underestimation of the Chinese ability to withstand Japanese attacks with occasionally disastrous consequences. With that said, let's talk about the Chinese military forces that were available at this point. There were a few key problems that would really hold them back during this fighting. First, a lot of the equipment available to the Chinese forces was old, which meant that it often was less capable than the Japanese items that they were matched against. This caused, for example, their artillery to be often outranged, but far more damaging than its age. All of the equipment was also incredibly non-uniform. There were all kinds of not just heavy equipment like artillery and machine guns, but also just rifles, which all created a logistical nightmare when it came to trying to supply the troops with what they needed and when they needed all those things. Because what they needed could greatly vary from unit to unit, even within the same formations. Second, there was simply not enough training uh, either within the ranks or among the officers. Estimates vary on this, but only about half or so of the Chinese soldiers would be considered fully trained, and there was a huge shortage of officers at almost all levels. This meant that those officers who were well trained were also heavily overworked, especially when it came to staff work, and those soldiers who were well trained often found themselves surrounded by those who were not. Third and finally, Not all of the forces that were nominally under the control of the government in Nanking were actually under their control. This comes back to the limits of of Chang's and the government's power that we discussed last episode. The result was that there was not one unified Chinese national army, but instead a collection of armies of, at times, dubious loyalty. To try and offset some of these issues, almost two-thirds of all government spending would go into the military in 1937 and the budgets in previous years were also very high. This did allow for the creation of some well-trained and well-equipped units, mostly with the help of German advisors and German equipment, and those units would be used in the Battle of Shanghai that will be our topic for next week. There was a general realization from the Chinese leaders that in a straight-up fight with the Japanese, things probably would not go very well, and so they became focused on drawing out the war. This was one of the operational goals of the Chinese military leadership, to create a scenario where they could maintain protracted resistance against the Japanese, in the belief that if they could do so, they could eventually arrive at victory, that they could essentially outlast them. Also, one small note that's that's very important as we move forward. Uh, The size of Chinese and Japanese military units were completely different, especially at the top end, with a Chinese core having between 10,000 and 15,000 soldiers, while a Japanese division was twice as large, with 24 to 28,000. This becomes very important when looking at military events, because when 10 Chinese corps attack 5 Japanese divisions, even though generally you could assume that the, the Chinese had this massive numerical advantage, during this period, they may be roughly similar. 10 corps to 5 divisions might be pretty close in number. That's really important as we start going through actual military events, and also if you do any additional reading 
on this topic because sometimes you'll see just an extreme number of Chinese corps or Chinese divisions attacking Japanese units, and it's important to remember that huge scale difference. The Japanese would begin their attacks on July 26th with an early focus on Beijing and Tianjin, which would both fall before the end of the month. There was never really any hope for the nationalists to defend these northern areas. Uh, Chang and the other Chinese leaders in fact held back most of their troops, and all of the best ones, for actions further south. This meant that the northern areas fell quickly, and but fighting still continued into August. In many areas, the Japanese would use tactics that they had used in the north as well, throwing bribes at local commanders to get them to retreat instead of fighting, and this accelerated their advance. However, because the Chinese were not resisting as strongly as they they maybe could have, there was nothing like a decisive blow against their forces. Instead, the Chinese defense just ended up quickly falling back. This went against the overall goal of the Japanese, who, who wanted to greatly reduce Chinese fighting capabilities, but to do so, they needed to reduce the total Chinese forces available, but they were denied those opportunities. Instead, they would just keep expanding. The Kwantung army would eventually take control of the northern half of the Shenzhi uh, province, while the newly created North China Area Army focused on moving south from Beijing. During these actions, the general staff had little precise influence on operations. The field commanders had been provided with an overall goal, an offensive campaign to annihilate Chinese forces. However, there was little precise guidance beyond that. This left the field commanders with a lot of power to make decisions, which were then post facto ratified by the general staff. The end result was the capture of a lot of territory, not meeting any territorial objectives set out at the beginning of the offensive, but a complete failure when it came to a reduction in Chinese fighting capabilities. Two important events would begin to shift the overall structure of the fighting in China and provide the Japanese with new opportunities to achieve these goals of annihilation. First, Cheng would reach out to the communists with the intention of making concessions to them if they would join in a united front against the Japanese, with the concession being that the communists would be allowed to form their own military and their own military units. This would work, and three communist leaders, Zhou Enlai, Zhu De, and Ye Jingying, would begin to participate in the meetings of the Military Affairs Commission in Nanking. The second important change was the decision to defend Shanghai when the fighting erupted there in the southern city. This would be the point where instead of continuing to retreat, the Chinese would stand their ground, setting the stage for the largest battle of the early stages of the war. 